In the last video, we introduced the idea of the, no, In this video, we're going to continue talking about monetary policy. Specifically, we're going to be talking about the best case for monetary policy. All right, so um, I've already drawn up kind of the starting uh, place for our, our model. All right, this is our long run equilibrium for our aggregate supply, aggregate demand model, so the, the model of our macro economy. Uh, so our long run equilibrium is where all three curves meet, the aggregate demand, short run aggregate supply, and the long run aggregate supply. All right, uh, so we have our equilibrium inflation rate, kind of our long run equilibrium, uh, and then we also have our long run equilibrium uh, real growth rate, also known as the solo growth rate. So I'm gonna, we're just gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, I will say um, as we go, um, I'm probably mostly just going to be leaving this graph uh, up here um, for the pertinent stuff for it while I'm showing you guys stuff. Uh, but you probably want to also write down some of the things that, that, um, that are being said, um, not just copying down the graph because without writing anything else down, you might not have context when you go back um, I guess you could, this, this is recorded, so you could just come and, and rewatch this, all right? Um, but you might want to write down stuff anyways. Okay, um, so uh, we'll go ahead and kind of get started with this. So the most straightforward case of monetary policy uh, is a negative shock to aggregate demand, uh, and specifically one that is uh, due to kind of consumer fears, right? Consumer slash investor fears. So we're going to go ahead and kind of show that portion of it. All right. So we know from our chapter of chapter 32 on aggregate supply, aggregate demand, uh, that the aggregate demand curve is based off of two things, right? The money supply growth rate uh, and the velocity of money growth rate, right? So add those two together and you get the spending growth rate, which is what the aggregate demand curve is based off of. Right? So increases in either of those growth rates are going to lead to an increase in aggregate demand. A decrease in any of those growth um, rates is gonna lead to a decrease in aggregate demand. Right? We also know, right, monetary policy, um, or the money supply, that's, that's really gonna be very much the, the Fed's business. Um, of increasing or managing that money supply in some respects. Uh, we'll talk about that later. Uh, but also changes to the velocity of money growth rate can affect our aggregate demand curve, right? Um, and that is affected through those different uh, components of the national spending approach to GDP, right? So our consumer spending, investment spending, government spending, and the uh, net exports. All right, so if consumers are pessimistic about their economic futures, right, or investors are, uh, either case, right, either the consumption spending growth rate will go down, or the investment spending growth rate will go down. All right, uh, I'm just gonna jot that up here real quick. So consumers, right, um, I'm, I'm gonna erase it probably pretty quickly because we don't have a lot of space on here. All right, consumers are pessimistic, we'll just say consumers. So our consumer spending or consumption spending growth rate, that's gonna decrease. That's gonna lead to the velocity of money growth rate decreasing because that money's not, right? This is kind of akin to people hiding money in their mattresses, right? So that money's not circulating because people aren't spending it. They're saving it rather than spending, all right? And I know this is kind of getting wonky, but, um, but then that, uh, so I really don't have enough space here. All right, uh, so consumption spending growth rate goes down, that leads to the velocity of money growth rate going down, and that ultimately leads to the aggregate demand going down. All right, and we know that when 
we have a decrease in demand, right, uh, we're going to shift our curve to the left. So we're going to draw in a new aggregate demand curve, and we're going to call this AD1, or at least that's what I'm going to call it. Alright, so when this happens, we get a new equilibrium. Alright, we get a short run equilibrium where our new aggregate demand curve intersects the short run aggregate supply. Alright, so if we were to just leave this alone uh, and let the economy kind of adjust itself, then eventually we would move to where our new aggregate demand curve intersects our long run aggregate supply curve, right? We'd get back to our uh, solo growth rate. Um, and we would have kind of lower, uh, a lower inflation rate. So we would experience, um, well, it would kind of depend on the situation, but our, our, at the very least, our inflation rate has, is going to be lower than it was. All right. uh, however, uh, the Fed might not want to suffer through the, the short run where we have decreased real GDP growth. Right? Um, so. Uh, instead, right, instead of waiting for the economy to adjust on its own, and we remember how that works, right, that's uh, changes to our short run aggregate supply curve based on, um, so the, the short run aggregate supply curve, if we remember, is based on the expected inflation rate. In the short run, the inflation rate has changed, so people are going to adjust their expectations, right? We're going to move this short run aggregate supply curve till it intersects with our long run aggregate supply and our new aggregate demand curve, right? Uh, but we, that, that takes a while, right? Um, that is, that's a, a very gradual process moving through all of that. So what the Fed wants to do instead is they want to use monetary policy to push aggregate demand from AD1, right, back up to AD0, right? So pushing us from the green aggregate demand curve up to the blue aggregate demand curve. All right, so they might use some kind of uh, expansionary um, monetary policy Right, to push, yeah, and just push back, push that aggregate demand curve back up. All right, so that is the best case scenario, right? If we have this negative shock to aggregate, aggregate demand, uh, at least in theory, uh, monetary policy could be used to just bring us back to where we were, right? So. We've got the same, we're, we're back at our solo growth rate, right? We're back at the, the same old inflation rate that we are used to, right? And so everything is hunky dory, right? Uh, however, there, probably unsurprisingly, there are some problems with this, right? Some difficulties. I'm just going to leave it at difficulties. All right, so these are the difficulties. Uh, there's only two of them, so uh, not going to be that, that intense. All right, um, but the first one, all right, uh, the Fed operates in real time with incomplete information
and the Fed has incomplete control of the money supply. All right, so these are the two difficulties. Let's uh, let's dig into these a little bit. All right. So with the first one, right, the Fed operates in real time with incomplete information. All right. So the Fed is trying to make decisions. Right. Again, in real time. So as as things are happening. Right. But it's impossible to get all of the data needed to make super precise decisions. Right in real time, right? Um, it takes months to collect and organize data, right? It takes a while to analyze that data to see well, what is the trend, right? What's happening to aggregate demand, right? Um, how, how much of a change are we seeing, right? How much do we need to increase or decrease the money supply by, right? Um, it's, um, that, that takes time, that information takes time, so by the time the Fed gets it, it's already out of date, right? Um, and that's what they have to use to make their decisions, right? Um, of course, they're, they're using predictive models and, and things to, to help them, um, and they're not just relying on that data, they're analyzing trends and so on and so forth, but at the same time, right, it is kind of lagged information Right? Um, and it's incomplete information, right? So some of the, the same, um, or actually I don't remember if we talked about that in this class. Um, hmm. I don't remember. Um, I don't remember if we talked about the socialist calculation, but um, if we haven't, the, the essential is um, it's, there's too much information out there, right, um, for one person or a group of people to efficiently direct um, an economy, right? Decide where goods need to go, how many there should be, how much the, well, I guess you wouldn't have prices in that case, but how much should go where and what's the best uses and so on and so forth, right? Um, but kind of the same thing happens here, right? There's just a lot of information. Um, there's a lot of information that um, the Fed could potentially get, um, but maybe it's just too costly or, or too time consuming to get it. Um, but there's also information that they, that's pertinent to these kinds of decisions that they just can't get. Right? Um, and so with that incomplete information, right, it's going to be difficult to perfectly increase aggregate demand by the amount desired. Right, the second difficulty, right, the Fed has incomplete control of the money supply. All right, so uh, if we think back to the last chapter and thinking about those definitions of the money supply, right, uh, the Fed had total control of the monetary base. Right? Our monetary base was uh, the currency, right, currency and total reserves. Right? That's the only thing that the Fed has complete control over. Right? But we saw that the other two kind of sections, M1 and M2, right, uh, have a, a big impact on the money supply. Right? So the and we had our little, little upside down triangle, right? So the Fed is trying to direct the big part, right, the wide part of that triangle with just the this the kind of small end, right? Um, the very bottom. So the Fed can do some kind of policy, all right? They can uh, be doing their open market operations. They could be, um, you know, changing their the interest rate they're paying, all right? Changing the federal funds rate, uh, but they're not the only ones that make that decision, right? Um, if the if they go out and start buying bonds, trying to you know do some expansionary monetary policy, right? Well, the banks and financial institutions, right, they're going to get that money, right? They're going to sell their bonds and, and receive money from the Fed. Right? And then it's kind of up to them to put that into the economy. Well, if the, the bankers right, or the, the people at these financial institutions are 
a little leery of future prospects, right, they might decide to just save some of that money right, instead of investing it elsewhere, right? Um, instead of doing things that are going to lead to an increase in aggregate demand. Right? Um, and so depending on things like, you know, what's the reserve ratio for a bank, right? Because the Fed's going to set, set their minimum, right? And then, but that's just the minimum, right? Uh, if you feel better, right, as a bank or an institution about having, you know, more of your deposits held in reserve because you don't want to have, you don't want to become illiquid, right, or, or whatever the case may be, right, then, you know, if you save one dollar for every two deposited, right, hold one dollar for every two deposited in, um, in the bank, right, then that's not going, then kind of, what would that be? Our, our money multiplier would be two, right, so whatever the amount would be that they're, they're selling or buying these bonds for, right, the economy would only increase, or right, the money supply would only increase by two times, right? Um, but if they're holding, only holding one dollar for every 10 deposited, then the amount that they're selling these, or buying these bonds for, that amount of money, right, if the, I'm gonna put some numbers to it, right, so if a bank has a low reserve ratio, Right, um, or I guess a high reserve ratio. So one dollar out of, or we'll, we'll simplify this. All right, so five dollars held in reserves for every ten dollars deposited. All right, so that's for the reserve ratio, five over ten. Right, one half, um, and the money multiplier would be two. All right, so if the government or if the Fed bought a million dollars worth of bonds, right, the money supply would increase by up to $2 million, all right? Um, so that's with a, a reserve ratio of one half, right? If we were saying, hold in reserve $1 for every 10 deposited, same rest of it, right? Our money multiplier would be 10, so buying $1 million worth of bonds would increase the money supply by $10 million, right? The Fed doesn't get to set the reserve ratio for banks. Right. They can set a minimum, but bankers, right, depending on how confident or pessimistic they are about the economy, might choose to change that. Right? They might want to hold uh, a larger uh, percentage in reserves. Right? Um, so these two things make it, it very difficult to, to conduct monetary policy. Um, I've actually heard um, a, a a banker from the a Federal Reserve, probably the the St. Louis one, um, or maybe well, it doesn't really matter where they're from. But um, essentially, saying that the the Fed is a hatchet, right? Um, the federal government is a scalpel, right? So um, we're going to talk more about the federal government and fiscal policy. Uh, it's a lot more uh, can can be a lot more detailed. But with monetary policy, all right, you're just, it's a blunt instrument, all right? We're just trying to get it close, all right? Because these things make it very difficult to actually really precisely uh, do something, all right? Uh, to precisely increase or decrease aggregate demand as the situation uh, is, uh, is needed. All right, uh, last couple of things for this video. Um, we're going to talk about what happens if the Fed overcorrects, right? Because that is a possibility, right? Um, the uh, amount of and the money that they are trying to inject into the economy, right? Uh, either it just might not be enough, right? Um, so they could undershoot it, um, or you know, um, banks are, are pessimistic, so they are, are holding more of it, so it, they undershoot it, right? Or the other thing could occur as well, right? Um, maybe the economy has already started to self-adjust by the time any of these kind of monetary policies get put into place. 
All right, because it does take a while to put them into place. All right, well, in that case, we could overshoot that, uh, we could overshoot our original aggregate demand curve. All right, so um, if they do this, all right, all right, this can lead to increased inflation. All right, so when we increase that aggregate demand curve, all right, we're going to uh, get a new short run equilibrium uh, where our real GDP growth rate is higher uh, and so is our, uh, our inflation rate in the short run. Uh, in the long run, our real GDP growth rate will go back to the solo growth rate, but our inflation rate will get higher, uh, even higher. All right, um, so uh, the government has to choose, right, if, if this starts happening, right, between high inflation or high unemployment. All right, so if we have this, this high inflation, all right, or if we're kind of getting into that, uh, that short run, right, where we get that short run boost to real GDP growth, all right, that's going to lead to more jobs, right, uh, businesses being created, so on and so forth. Right? So if you try to rein that back to decrease the inflation rate, right, then you're going to see unemployment. Right? Um, so um, in the 70s, some believe, uh, or not people, well, uh, so some believe that during the 70s, the Fed overstimulated, right? Um, by 1980, the uh, inflation rate was 13.5%, which is an astounding inflation rate. All right, uh, so the chairman of the Fed and the president decided to try to decrease this, all right? So if anyone's interested, all right, probably know it, the president at the time was Ronald Reagan, all right? The chairman of the Fed at the time was uh, Paul Volcker, all right? Um, they set out to reduce this inflation rate um, and somewhat aggressively, I would, I would say, all right? Uh, and by 1983, The inflation rate had gone down to 3%, but the unemployment rate had increased to 10%, right? which uh, also is a fairly high uh, unemployment rate. All right. um, this is also one of the things that we meant uh, when we were in the inflation chapter, talking about how inflation is, diff is painful to stop. Right? Uh, when you've got this high inflation rate, right, um, you're going to have lower rates of unemployment, but this inflation rate is still not very good. And especially when you start to try to decrease the uh, inflation rate, right, you're going to see uh, a lot of unemployment, right? Again, because um, uh, these contracts are more expensive, right? Because what you know, you know, the the in, the the cost of living increases that you've you've put in your contract, right? Any long-term stuff is going to be based off an assumption of a higher inflation rate, right? So when it's lower, right, all that stuff becomes more expensive, right? And some companies are not going to be able to uh, afford that. All right. Um, then the very last thing, um, and I'm actually not even going to write this down, all right? But uh, you... Um, it is kind of important. So uh, another really important role of the Fed is to manage um, consumer confidence and investor confidence. Right? Um, if you know consumers or investors are pessimistic, right, that can kind of create a cascading effect. So, for example, if you're an investor, right, um, if you are are not sure about uh, kind of the future economically, right, then you might not do some big project, right? So you might not um, take out a loan to, to do some project, or you might not take this money and, and put it into the economy. You might save it and wait for things to get better, right? Well, there might be other people out there that are also going to not go forward with their invested investments, right? 
One, because they, they might also have some of those fears, but also um, the fact that you aren't investing, right? All right, you're not going forward with your investment means that theirs will be, or is less likely to be successful, right? Because they needed kind of both things happening at once, right? Um, and so if um, we have those decreased levels of consumer confidence, right, or investor confidence, then uh, the Fed coming out and said, hey, we're going to, you know, we know that uh, they're not going to say this outright, but we know that aggregate demand has decreased, or they might, that depends on who they're talking to, right? And we're going to do something to try to boost it back up. So then other consumers feel better, they start spending their money, the investors start investing in capital again, so on and so forth, right? And so we increase that aggregate demand, right? Uh, but again, um, kind of managing consumer confidence, another role that the uh, Fed uh, uh, kind of plays. Um, but uh, that is it for this video. Uh, it got a little longer than I intended, but um, that's what happens, right? Um, in the next video, which will probably also be the last of this um, chapter, uh, we're gonna look at what's known as the negative real shock dilemma, all right? Um, and uh, we might have some other stuff, but I think that's probably going to be it. All right, uh, but that'll be in the next video, and I will see you then.